I am. So today's session about presidential powers and precedents, what's the limit? We're going to open with just a quick exercise. It is going to be a little bit like Wheel of Fortune. I'm going to give you some puzzles. We're going to try and solve them together. And the quicker that we solve them, the quicker that we go on to the new content. Let me see if I can get to you. Here we go. All right. The big blue screen. Presidential powers and precedents. What's the limit? So when you're talking about presidential powers, you're looking to the United States Constitution. In particular, Article 2 spells out the powers of the president. And so the way that I remember those is I call them the four C's. So you're going to help me identify what the four C's are. Wheel of Fortune style. But I'm not going to give them all to you at once. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to start with the first one. And let me know in the chat if at any time you want to buy a vowel. Because you can buy a vowel. So let's start with. Oh, wait, nope. It already bought a vowel. I'm trying to get out of this Q&A that's on top of my screen. OK, so the answer remote control is not working. OK, so the executive power be vested in a president of the United States. What would be a phrase that begins with a C that would capture that? Capture that concept. Would you like to buy a vowel? Yes, anyone? Yes? Would you like to buy all the vowels at once? We'll do that. Let's try that again. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, looking at this two word phrase, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Would you like a clue? A clue? Anyone? The second word is already on the slide. Anyone think they know what it is? I cannot see the chat for some reason. There's the chat. Uh, executive. So what do we, um, and Sylvia, don't you work at the Carter Library? Um, yes. All right, so what do we think that first word is? If the second word is executive, four C's, what do we call the head of a chief, chief executive? Thank you, Connor. All right, this is supposed to be pretty quick. Let's go on to the next slide with our answer, chief executive. Next up. The president shall be blank of the Army and Navy of the United States. Starts with a C. Starts with a C, it's a different C. Would you like to buy a vowel? Easy, commander in chief. Thank you, Sylvia, yes. You are correct. So let's fast forward through the vowels and the answer. So we've got two of the four C's. We've got chief executive and commander in chief. Moving on, let's take a look at the president shall have power by and with advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties. Start also a phrase that starts with the C. Anyone? Oh, Sylvia, don't stop. You can play. Would you like to buy a vowel? Would you like to buy all the vowels? Yes, please. Okay. 
We're moving forward. Okay, so what do you think that first word might be? It's a word we've used before. Chief diplomat. Yes. Yes. Chief diplomat. And then the second, the last one, so that's three. So chief executive, commander in chief, chief diplomat. And then the last one is probably the most difficult. It's the longest. And it is. The president shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. So thinking about a word, a phrase, right? So we've got one word, it's four word phrase. Think about a three word phrase that we use to refer to leaders of foreign governments. Are the last three words head of state? Yes, they are, Ryan. And so we're going with, do you want vowels? To see if you can guess what that for the uh, modifier is there. Not commander, it's a little bit longer. Ceremonial, ceremonial head of state. All right, so that is an easy, fun way to remember the duties of the president as defined in the Constitution. And I'm gonna share this PowerPoint. I've, I'm gonna speak much later about um, the president as commander in chief and, and what limits, what's the limit with that power. But right now I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Elizabeth Denshell. She is the education specialist at the Hoover Library. Hello everybody. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully everything is up. My name is Elizabeth Dinchel. I'm an archivist and the education specialist at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. And we are located in West Branch, Iowa, in case anybody was looking for us. Today I'm going to talk about the bonus march. And so what I want to do is start off with context and we're going to go through it very quickly. So don't blink, you'll miss it. Look for examples of how this event connects to constitutional rights. I'll try to point them out as we move through, but you should be able to pick up on it. There is a link to the Prezi that I use with the students and a YouTube video of me giving the presentation that I shared with you in that folder, along with the five documents for the document set. Um, we're gonna use those documents in a student activity. And my goal is to help you take that document set and use it with your students in the classroom where students can interpret, close read and analyze the documents. The students should be able to build a timeline of events an analytical narrative and draw conclusions about how the situation was handled. And ultimately, the question in this event is, did the president have the power to do any of the things that he did? So we're going to jump right in. On May 2nd, 1922, a Hearst newspaper truck from New York City delivered a petition to the U.S. Capitol that had more than one million signatures in support of a bonus for World War I veterans. The document said, we respectfully petition Congress, petition Congress to pass the Soldiers Bonus Act without further delay, and also to levy a sales tax to obtain the money to pay the bonus. Congress passed a bonus in 1922, but President Warren Harding vetoed it. In 1924, Congress passed another bonus bill. On May 15, 1924, President Coolidge vetoed it, and he said, quote unquote, patriotism bought and paid for is not patriotism. So at this point, unemployment is growing exponentially year over year during Hoover's presidency, and it reaches nearly 25% by 1932. Veterans are struggling all over the country, a lot of them dealing with symptoms of shell shock from World War I. So in May of 1932, Walter Waters, an Army veteran, proposed that every veteran head to Washington, D.C. and demand their bonus. The movement picked up steam and spread across the country, and they declared the opening day of Congress, December 5, 1932, the day they would arrive in D.C. The number of participants varied, but since many men were accompanied by their wives and children, 
the Bonus Army may have numbered as many as 60,000. The group was often known as the Bonus Ex Expeditionary Forces, the Bonus March, or the Bonus Army. So all three of those names are used interchangeably. Upon arrival, some of the Bonus Marchers constructed campsites on Anacostia Flats. Others occupied abandoned buildings in the city. In addition to the camps in Anacostia, 26 smaller camps sprung up around DC, but they were mostly concentrated in the northeast side of the city. Some observers believe that a portion of the marchers were not veterans, but communists and criminals bent on causing a confrontation. Though the estimate numbers of criminals varied considerably, it's proven later that they didn't really exist, if at all, very small numbers. Many of Mr. Hoover's advisors and members of Congress suggested that Hoover ordered the army to disperse the marchers, as President Cleveland had done in a similar situation 38 years earlier. So there is a precedent for this event. But Hoover believed that most of the marchers were honest veterans and should be allowed to assemble so long as they did so peacefully. So here's one of our First Amendment uh, things coming up. On June 15th, the House of Representatives passed the bonus bill by a vote of 211 to 176. The Hoover Republicans opposed the bill because they wanted a balanced budget. Hoover threatened to veto the bill. The Senate voted on June 17th. More than 8,000 veterans gathered in front of the Capitol to wait for the vote. Police raised the Anacostia drawbridge to hold back more than 10,000 veterans. Around 9.30 p.m., Senate aides called for Waters, the leader of the bonus march, to tell him that the bill had been defeated. Many of the protesters went home, aided by Hoover's offer of interest-free loans charged against their bonus certificates to pay for their train fares home. A few thousand remain behind, though, I, well, but the numbers varied widely, some of it because there was women and children again. Um, but it was widely reported that most of the honest veterans had gone home and that many of those who remained were communists, criminals, or other agitators who had not even served in the military. So now we're gonna look at five documents for our activity so we can get a good idea of how we build this narrative at this point. I wanna encourage all of you to visit the National Archives website where we have document analysis sheets. And up here I have the document analysis sheet for written document from our website. The link is also in the folder I sent you. And what they're doing is introducing the students to the idea uh, or to the practice of thoroughly evaluating a document, not just reading it. We're looking at clues like stamps, letterheads, date when it was written, who it was written to, who wrote it, what the audience is. Is it a speech? Is it a letter? Is it a newspaper? They're really breaking down all of the moving parts that we kind of do just out of nat you know, natural practice. A lot of us have been looking at these documents for decades. So this really breaks it down for the students so they can analyze it properly. So now I wanna take us to our first document to look at. And I've put some highlights in here to kind of show you the important parts of the document, what we want our students to get from it. So looking at this first document, we see it's from the commissioners of the District of Columbia it's July 28th, 1932, and it's written to the president. On the morning of July 28th, the Treasury Department officials attempted to evacuate about 40 protesters who had been occupying a building in downtown Washington, D.C. that was scheduled for demolition. When the protesters refused to leave, the police were called in. The bonus army began to gather in force, soon outnumbering the police. Some of the policemen panicked and opened fire. Two of the marchers were killed and a riot broke out. The District of Columbia Board of Commissioners quickly concluded that the police were overwhelmed and asked President Hoover to send in troops to restore order. And so we can see that here in this first paragraph that's highlighted. They're talking about being met with resistance and what the police faced. But the second paragraph is really interesting. They say, 
It will be impossible for the police department to maintain law and order except by the free use of firearms, which will make the situation a dangerous one. They go on to say that it's believed that law and order can be um, put back if they call in the military, if they can use federal troops. So this is what's sent to Hoover initially. So let's look, this letter is dictated by Hoover, same day, July 28th, 1932. And he says, Congress made a provision for the return home of the so-called bonus marchers who have for many weeks been given every opportunity a free assembly, free speech, and free petition to the Congress. So these are the main parts of the First Amendment that we can break down with our students and talk about how the soldiers were able to exercise those rights. He says 5,000 of them took advantage uh, of that and have gone home. Um, and that the considerable part of remaining are not veterans. Many are communists and persons with criminal records. So they're trying to justify now sending in federal troops saying that the majority of the good veterans have gone home. So let's go on to this next document. Uh, this goes to General Douglas, Douglas MacArthur, that name should sound familiar, uh, Chief of Staff for U.S. Army, same day. This one actually is a timestamp, 2.55 p.m. And it is from Patrick Hurley, the Secretary of War for Hoover. Hoover ordered the Secretary of War, Patrick Hurley, to cooperate with the police. Hurley ordered Douglas MacArthur, the Army Chief of Staff, to cooperate fully with the District of Columbia Police Force, which is now in charge. Surround the affected area and clear it without delay. Turn over all prisoners to civil authorities. In your orders, insist that any women and children who may be in the affected area be accorded every consideration and kindness. Use all humanity consistent with the due execution of this order. So they, the military is being told to remove the protesters at this point. So now we're going on to July 29th. This is from the White House uh, to the commissioner from the District of Columbia. If we take a look down here, it is from Herbert Hoover. So uh, Herbert Hoover says, I complied with your request for aid from the army to, uh, for, from the army to the police. I wish to call attention of the district commissioners to the fact that martial law has not been declared, that responsibility for order still rests upon your commission and the police. The civil government of Washington must function uninterrupted. I wish every violator of the law to be instantly arrested and prosecuted under due process of the law. Due process of the law is another right that is guaranteed to American citizens under the Constitution. And he ends with this real stinger. There is no group, no matter what its origins, that can be allowed either to violate the laws of this city or to intimidate the government. Yours faithfully, Herbert Hoover. So he's really put his foot down now. He said, you know, we're gonna clear them out, but he also says he doesn't wanna declare martial law. So you have to start thinking about what is the president's rights to um, disperse protesters from Washington, DC? And what's, you know, what does the police have the power to do and the military have the power to do? So let's move on to this last document. This one's a real stinger. Uh, it comes from September 23rd, 1932. The bonus march is way over at this point. But this is a recollection of events because at this point, this event has already been tried in the court of public opinion and it was not good. So MacArthur thought the riot might be the beginning of a communist revolution. And he immediately made plans, not only to quell the riot, but also to force the evacuation of the campsites on Anacostia Flats and expel the bonus army from the district. He later claimed that the police superintendent um, had, virtually uh, had verbally requested such an action. MacArthur assembled a battalion of infantry, a squadron of cavalry, and a platoon of tanks to deploy against the rioters. At 4.30 p.m., MacArthur forces began to advance slowly, ordering groups of rioters to disperse as they encountered them. Tear gas was used when the groups refused to cooperate. The soldiers arrived at Anacostia Flats a little after 9 p.m. 
Most of the protesters had fled the area. Soon the empty shacks and campsites were in flames. MacArthur claimed that he had specifically prohibited the burning of the camps and that they had been set ablaze by burning or by fleeing rioters. And so he says that here, there is no plan to burn these shelters. He said, I don't know how, how they originated. But then bam, the military has a picture of a soldier setting fires. So what has happened here? It says that uh, they gave an order to back burn basically uh, campsites so that the fires wouldn't spread. Um, he ordered his forces to demolish the remaining campsites um, and to gather any army tents, cots, and supplies that were provided to the bonus marchers by the government. The next day, the troops rounded up stragglers and completed the destruction of the campsites. And um, he talks about this, that uh, the policemen gave orders. There was this confusion about who burned what down. Um, and eventually in the end, he says the fires in the camps on the flats were initiated by the occupants of the camp. The infantry was held in formation along the riverbank for an hour before it moved into the camp to assure the latter's evacuation. And so this is from one of the commanders here. So after this happens, one of the really important things that we can do with our students is to look at the fallout. After we build this narrative, how did the public interpret the situation? FDR was famously quoted as saying, this definitely won him the election. Um, it was tried in the court of public opinion. It was on newsreels and newspapers all over the country. The press covered it in a variety of ways just like we see uh, how the press covers things now. Um, I think this topic is very relevant for looking at how the First Amendment interacts with legislation, which we saw here. The police department who are maintaining law and order um, when protesters are on the streets and the police department and this unique um, power that exists between federal government and local city government in Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is not a state, so they have to ask for federal help. That's what I have for you guys today, zoomed right through it. Um, definitely let me know if you have questions. I've provided you guys with the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the links and the folders in the chat box. If you want to take a look at that, feel free to do so. And that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you. Awesome. So I think we have Angela Estep up next. She's going to talk about Truman and the steel crisis. Is that right? Angela, are you here? Angela's here. All Angela, right. you are muted. I am muted. Okay, it kicked me out for a minute. So I'm back. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. Sorry about that, it's a little slow. I don't know why. <laughs> That's the beauty of technology. That's right. Uh, Often unpredictable. That's right, and now I don't have my chat line, um, my chat box. So Mark, are you on the line? Can you help I me am, with the chat? I am, and I've got right. the chat ready for you. All right, well, it kicked me off and I rejoined and then I lost it. So anyway, I am Angela Estep and I'm from the Harry S. Truman Library and I'm excited to be here today with the Presidential Primary Source Project uh, to talk about presidential power. So we've had a great lead in so far, but I just wanna show you a little 
picture of our new museum. We're a little excited. This is the new entrance. Uh, we've had a $30 million renovation this year. And so we're excited to be opening up in just a little bit. And on our new entrance, you can see the presidential seal and we're gonna have a President Truman and welcoming guests as they come in. So hopefully uh, if you guys can, anybody can come to Independence of Missouri, we'd love to see you. We're gonna go ahead and start with a primary source, uh, a political cartoon. And in the chat box, I would like to uh, have you use your visual thinking skills. Tell me, what do you see in this? And don't be shy, everybody. <laughs> Somebody says, uh, Hava says grabbing power with a question Grabbing mark. power? Yes. And then Carolyn says eminent domain. Ah, interesting. And there's a whole bunch, so forgive me. Uh, Ryan says government, <laughs> governmental overreach. Mark says seizing of private companies. Ethan says the government taking control of private companies. Connor goes out for it and says anti-communist propaganda and seizure. Kathy, oh my. <laughs> Kathy says King Kong hand, King Kong like hand, they're testing me out uh -huh. today. And then uh, Josh says implementation of the Clean Air Act. And those are all incredible su uh, suggestions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. Did you, did you look at the captions? I know you guys even uh, stepped out and said a few more things in the captions. You can see the overreaching hand coming through the constitution and yes, over the private property. So great job. Uh, one more question is who do you think the audience is for this? It was published in the new in uh, Nickenbacker in new in the news in New York. And we got three different responses. Mark says Congress. Ethan says uh -huh. private individuals. Ryan says voters, and Kathy says businesses, industrial, and Melissa agrees and says industry. So lots of different audiences uh, there. Congress, yeah, private individuals, voters, businesses, industry. And all of those are actually correct. If it's in the correct. newspaper, anyone who reads the news. So yeah, good job guys. Um, you just saw um, Elizabeth showed a worksheet a few minutes ago that's on our archives.gov. And she showed it, it was a secondary for uh, primary documents. And this uh, is an example of a guide you could use with students when you show a primary source. Uh, and this one is for political cartoons and this one's for elementary. So they offer uh, several in several different uh, categories, the elementary and the secondary. Um, I will be showing you a motion picture or video in just a little while and there's one also for that one. So that's a great way for visual uh, strategy, thinking skills for kids in a guide. All right, so to explain a little bit about this, we're gonna have to go back in time. And if you, um, we gotta look at our economy. We gotta look after World War II, what was going on? Our soldiers are coming back. We've got factories that are being re reconverted from military and defense products to consumer products. There are mass producing automobiles, airplanes, all kinds of consumer products. Uh, we've got the FHA helping people get into homes. Uh, we've got the GI Bill. All of these people are starting to move into homes. You've got people who were saving for these war bonds and they're ready to cash those in and start spending. Uh, they're going to need refrigerators. All kinds of the economic activity is going on. We've got a big boom. We've got the Marshall Plan where we're donating billions of dollars to Europe to help rebuild Europe. And so it's a good time uh, in the economy. And even the workers uh, are saying, we need more money. We need wage increases. So there's 2 million workers that are striking during this time. So Congress picks this up and they say, we know the labor unions are getting a little strong. So we need to, uh, we need to see what we can do here. And they passed a Taft-Hartley Act. And so what this allowed is the president could restrict these strikes for up to 80 days. Uh, and they included in there that the president cannot seize property. Well, Truman, he, he was more a uh, supporter of the workers. So Truman, he didn't like this bill, so he vetoed it. 
Well, Congress came back and they overrode his veto. Um, this leads into the next crisis that President Truman uh, has to deal with and one of the most difficult decisions um, is when North Korea invaded South Korea. Well, he had problems uh, with this Congress when he was running for election. He, um, he had more negatives to things to say about the 80th Congress than he actually did his opponent. Uh, he called them the do-nothing Congress. So when it came time, he had to make the decision. He wanted to uh, protect against communism, um, but he didn't really want to go through Congress to do that. So he went through the United Nations and he sent troops over to Korea. So Congress gives him a Defense Production Act, okay? He can go ahead and get the supplies he needs. He can get the weapons. He can get everything he needs. And he can get those for the soldiers over in North Korea. Uh, but that's when um, the steel workers, they decide, you know what, our labor agreement is up December 31st. We're, we need more wages. We need to increase our wages. So we're going to go on strike. Um, and President Truman, he knows this is a national catastrophe. If this happens, how is he going to get the soldiers in Korea the things that they need? Um, so he, he can't allow this. So what he does is he doesn't want to use the Taft-Hartley Act. He instead uses the Defense Production Act. He sets up a wage and stabilization board, stabilization, uh, and they spend months working on negotiations and meetings, panels. They have hearings, compromises, and all of these fail. So right before, hours before the strike is going to start on April the 9th, he makes an announcement. I'm gonna show you just a short video right here of President Truman. Some of the analysis that you would wanna do with your students is when, what's going on, who made this, uh, what's, you know, what is it for, when did it take place? But what I want you to do in the chat box is, what is the mood or tone of President Truman? It's about a minute and a half. <laughs> I would not be living up to my oath of office if I failed to do whatever is required to provide them with weapons and ammunition they need for their survival. Therefore, I am taking two actions. First, I'm directing the Secretary of Commerce to take possession of the steel mills and to keep them operating. in this story is the power of the president and its limits. Not often is the president's authority directly attacked in a lawsuit, but that is what happened in the administration of Harry S. Truman in the second year of the Korean War, when he ordered the federal government to seize the major steel mills of the United States. The legality of that action, debated with intense feeling, was finally resolved by the United States Supreme Court. This is the story of its ruling and the conflict that led to it. The story of a president's power contested. Okay, so you can see, um, what do you think his mood or his tone was when President Truman, this told you when and where and what's going on. So what was his mood? We're waiting for some answers, but I would say personally, somebody wrote in determined. Determined, S Sylvia, that's a good one. Silva said determined. Mm -hmm. Kathy said somber. Somber's a good word for that. Very matter yes. of fact, this is the way it is, says Patrick. Yes. I would add serious myself. I thought it looked very serious. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, he was pretty frustrated. He, all of those things, absolutely, he was. And so, yes, he, he did the uh, executive um, action and he said, we're we gonna take couple, over. We have a couple more. Uh-huh. Uh, Ethan says decisive. Yes. And um, 
Tr Carolyn says Truman was an everyman and probably was put in a position of having to work against them. Mood was very direct, says Mark. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there, I think they captured that pretty well. Very good. All right. Thanks, you guys, for uh, participating. But yeah, you are, all of you are right. Um, he, he was. Uh, he was determined to, to take care of his soldiers. He felt like, uh, according to the Constitution, his inherent powers uh, were vested in him as the executive, uh, a president, and commander in chief. And so he didn't want work stoppage. He didn't want to um, have anything uh, go against his soldiers in North Korea, South Korea. So as you can imagine, here are the headlines. The U.S. seizes steel industry. The strikes canceled and Truman's action touches off a court battle. He says right here, Truman, he insists these courts and Congress, they cannot end his inherent powers. He firmly believes in what that he's doing and that he does have those inherent powers. But as it said, Youngstown Street and Tube Company, they do, they file a lawsuit, it goes to court. Uh, and President Truman, you know, he still stands up for what he believes. The corporations come back and say, well, no, by doing this, you are, you're making a law. Congress is the only ones who can make law. You can't do that. And so that was their argument. Ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled the steel seizure was ruled illegal. Um, they said this was a landmark case because uh, it's unconstitutional for President Truman to seize private property. They said that Congress is the only one that can do that. Um, Congress was never, never authorized this war in Korea. Um, and it reaffirmed the separation of powers uh, between the branches. Now, after this was over, the steel companies were, uh, they were happy with this decision. Most of Congress and majority of Americans, they were all happy with this ruling and even the steel workers because now they can finally go on strike. But President Truman, now he took it as a personal blow. Uh, he took it, he, Roosevelt had appointed five of those judges. He had appointed four. He felt like he had the inherent powers from the constitution. Uh, he was upset. He didn't see where um, they could do that to him. Um, and he never got over it. From what I heard, he never really got over that his Congress went against him, the Supreme Court went against him. Ultimately, the soldiers in Korea did get what they needed. Um, and, the, and actually the steel workers, they did end up getting the wage increases that they had asked for. So this concludes a landmark decision. President does not have the power. It reaffirms the separation of powers. You can go on to our website at trumanlibrary.gov. We have a, a specific lesson on this. Uh, we have partnership with the Learning Collaborative. They have done a, an inquiry design model lesson. How much power does a president actually have? Uh, we've also partnered with Explorable Places and they're, they're connecting the classroom to the museums. Um, so that's a good place to go there. And of course, archives.gov if uh, you want to use the worksheets for any of the primary sources. Um, so I'd like to say thank you for joining us. And my, my uh, email is angela.estep at nara.gov if you have any questions or if you need anything. And next up, Kathleen, you're gonna, invite, you're gonna introduce. Well, since you practice saying his last name, I'm, I'm gonna let you take the lead with this one. <laughs> All right, uh, I would like to introduce Josh Montanara and he's from the Carter uh, Library. <laughs> Okay, hey everybody. I'm Joshua Montanari, an education specialist at the Jimmy Carter uh, Presidential Library and Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a topic today that spanned three decades and six different presidential administrations, somehow in 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but it's very near and dear to my heart as a former National Park Ranger who spent about two years of their life uh, working in national parks in the state of Alaska. So I'm very excited to make this uh, presentation with you all today. Let me just get my screen shared. Okay, and I'll get this started. Okay, and anyone can, whoever's moderating can feel free to announce any questions that someone might have while I'm speaking and I can address those at the end of the program as well. We'll have a closing discussion when we get to that point. 
Uh, so my topic is conservation and controversy in Alaska, Jimmy Carter, ANILCA, and the Antiquities Act. ANILCA being the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. So put it in context, this will uh, involve uh, talking about Alaska statehood, the Antiquities Act of 1906, uh, ANILCA, and the constitutional checks and balances uh, on President Carter's use of this, which we can talk a little later about how it applies to other presidents uh, using that. And throughout the presentation, uh, I typically have, I'll have links, typically in the blue text there, most of the documents I have, if it's a National Archives, you'll see a hyperlink so you can inspect that a little further but getting the, back to Jimmy Carter's roots uh, he's rooted in conservation himself a land ethic gained during his childhood a great book to read an hour before daylight about his experiences growing up in Plains Georgia uh, and he really develops a faith-based environmentalism uh, to love and obey God and that includes the creations um, of the creation of the world Jim Carter rises to governor of the state of Georgia. He establishes the Georgia Heritage Trust. He vetoes more than 600 applications to drain swamp lands, which protects vital wetland eco ecosystems. I think Jimmy Carter maybe knew about a lot of stuff happening in Florida. If anybody knows anything about Florida, basically the filter of the eastern half of the United States. We lost a lot of that with folks filling in the land and draining swamps. President Carter didn't want to see that happen in Georgia. Now, when he's running for president in 1976, there's a lot of environmental momentum in the United States. And contrary to any preconceived notions uh, people might have about President Richard Nixon, uh, the Nixon administration is actually extremely responsive to the environmental movement. Uh, we have the creation of the EPA in 1970, and then we see uh, notable legislation, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, uh, and a multitude of other federal regulations on pesticides and insecticides. And we see a reminder there of Carter capitalizing on environmental momentum. Uh, his campaign had that motif of the color green. Most of his campaign materials, publications would have that somewhere in them. When he gains election to the White House, he begins with an environmental message to Congress, which among many other things includes natural resources and national heritage and what he's going to do about it. In fact, he has made it his top environmental priority to get an Alaska lands bill passed in his administration. And here is why he wants to do that. When Alaska gained statehood in 1959, uh, this agreement includes a mandate for 104 million acres to be transferred to state control for the state of Alaska to do with as it sees fit. 1971, we see passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Uh, so in this case, we have the tribes of Alaska more or less getting some form of compensation. 44 million acres of land, 96, 962 and a half million dollars uh, to their corporations. So they had, had formed, I believe, 13 native tribal corporations uh, to disperse that through. And the Secretary of the Interior withdrew 80 million acres for the conservation purposes. Uh, there is a deadline, unfortunately for Jimmy Carter, and on December 18th, 1978, to implement these things. So whether he likes it or not, his uh, administration does have to face this issue and find resolution. So deadlines, they come, they go. Alaska files uh, litigation. Carter seeks advice. The Constitution explicitly says the president may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments. Carter does that very plainly. Seeks the advice of the Secretary of the Interior, uh, on use of the Antiquities Act of 1906. He also does this of his Secretary of Agriculture. And this has been recommended to him by the White House Council. Now the Antiquities Act of 1906, 
basically says the President of the United States is authorized uh, to declare by public proclamation historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, and other objects of historic or scientific interest um, to be national monuments. Now that uh, the bold text there, I think this is kind of in the pattern of the United States Constitution of legislation. We tend to not be very concise or specific for better or for worse, whether that's allowing something to progress forward or allowing for um, room uh, later down the road if it needs to be revisited. But the Antiquities Act is no different. It's just like why we had to have a 14th Amendment, a 19th Amendment, Civil Rights Act of 1964, a Voting Rights Act of 1965, and we're still uh, trying to resolve uh, voting in our country, uh, many would argue. This is kind of one of those cases. The Antiquities Act has been debated since it was passed by Congress and signed into law by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and by the way, Teddy Roosevelt invokes the Antiquities Act about 18 times during his presidency to proclaim new national monuments in the United States. Now, has this executive power been checked? We do have a case. 1943, Franklin Roosevelt sets aside Jackson Hole National Monument in Wyoming. Folks that just, and that's just south of Yellowstone National Park, America's first national park. A lot of folks aren't so happy about that. There's a lot of acts of civil disobedience that follow. In 1950, President Truman seeks to elevate that national monument to Grand Teton National Park. The compromise they come to with the state of Wyoming to establish this national park, to give it real permanence, is no further extension or establishment of national parks or monuments in Wyoming unless express authorization from Congress. So we see this law maybe weakened a little bit. We see a precedent set that it is a valid law, perhaps on a case by case or state by state basis. Uh, and that does become a revision to the Antiquities Act itself. And we have a link for that uh, to the US House of Representatives. A beautiful picture, by the way, by Ansel Adams. We have quite a few of those uh, in the National Archives collection. So Jimmy Carter takes all of that into account. On December 1st, 1978, he decides to take that leap of faith. And he invokes the Antiquities Act to set aside a 55 million acre chunk of land in Alaska to protect that. Secretary of the Interior uh, Andrews withdraws an additional 40 million acres for a 20 year period. So that's not something the state of Alaska is necessarily crazy about. So there's 20 years we might not know what's going to happen with this land. Naturally, unrest and acts of civil disobedience, like the one we see here pictured, break out in areas near uh, these new public land designations. In case you can't make it out, uh, in the middle of that fire is a representation of Jimmy Carter. In fact, he commented at the Alaska State Fair, they would often have a dunking booth where you would throw at a target to either have someone dressed as the Ayatollah or someone dressed as himself uh, fall into the water. He thinks most, uh, he was told most people, they aimed for him to be dunked <laughs> as opposed to the Ayatollah. So that gives you an idea of the sentiment in Alaska, or at least of the perception of what was happening. But again, President Carter is invoking this to pressure Congress to act. They are under that deadline. I don't think he wants to deal with this going into a second term, or he doesn't want to leave it for his successor. So for a, over the course of two years, more or less, even after Carter loses the election, he still has the Antiquities Act in his back pocket. In other words, saying to Congress, even if I'm not coming back after January 20th, I've still got a couple months and I can make more proclamations through this law. And my successor will be just tied up in endless litigation. I don't think anybody wanted that President Carter recognized that, Congress recognized that, so they come to the table and they pass the Alaska National Interest Lands 
Conservation Act, with the caveat that any future public land designations in Alaska greater than 5,000 acres will require congressional approval. So again, we kind of see uh, the same thing happen here as what happened with the state of Wyoming. Just to give you a better idea of what that law entails, it's guidance on all federal public lands, uh, wilderness, subsistence, very uh, particularly dealing with Alaska Native tribes. They had been waiting to know what lands were designated for them to continue their culture uh, and to subsist on. Uh, transportation, utility corridors, oil and gas leasing, mining, public access, hunting and trapping, all of that is settled. And the state of Alaska gets their 104 million acres of land that now converts from federal to state. Uh, but this, again, at like many accomplishments of presidents, this had been building over the last six administrations. So we see it coming to fruition with Carter right at the deadline. Uh, just to give you an idea, here is a list of the public land uh, units created uh, or altered. Some of them were maybe expanded or uh, given a new facet, such as Denali National Park had a preserve aspect added to that. Uh, each of these has a hyperlink to the respective websites if you would like to learn more about uh, these areas. And so the, this, the question is, did President Carter, technically any president who has used the Antiquities Act, have they exceeded their constitutional authority or haven't they? So if we can go ahead and get in our chat box there, I just have three questions that we can discuss. Number one, did President Carter's use of the Antiquities Act in Alaska exceed constitutional powers of the executive branch? And again, this is a president invoking a law passed by Congress, signed by the president at the time. The president's job is to enforce laws like President Eisenhower calling the National Guard out to Little Rock High School. Not quite the same uh, situation, but again, the president is using this established law. So it's not necessarily an executive order. Uh, we see a lot of those happening right now in the Trump administration. This is acting according to a law. Josh, we have a couple of responses. Okay, what do we have? We, Ethan says no, and then Patrick says no. He needed to meet a deadline and carry out the laws. Okay. And any other responses we're getting? I mean, that one, I think is a little more straightforward because it's not, it, there are some precedents that have been set here for Carter to use this. Now, were there checks and balances applied to his actions by the legislative and judicial branches or by the state of Alaska? Um, I think we did see some checks and balances there because this didn't um, end as simply being his proclamation. It brought Congress to the table. They got a say in it. Uh, the judicial branch, I think, had uh, validated earlier president's use of this law. But uh, let's see what you all think. So Mark says, no, Jimmy Carter dealt with this and possibly the Panama Canal issue as well. Okay. Anybody else? So I think there, this is Kathleen, and I feel like these questions are trick questions because I think the answer <laughs> is yes, yes and no. Right. And definitely with uh, President Clinton, he has his own experience with this, with the establishment of uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in, in uh, southern Utah. In fact, that area was shrunken by the Trump administration who also applied the same actions to Bears Ears National Monument, which was set aside by President Obama through the Antiquities Act at the end of his administration. So this is still ongoing. This is definitely uh, not in the past and applies to multiple presidents. In fact, I think almost all presidents, except maybe Eisenhower and Reagan, I'd have to double check, 
But I think just about every president from Teddy Roosevelt forward uh, has invoked the Antiquities Act at some point. And do we think that the Antiquities Act itself was strengthened, weakened, not changed at all by Carter's use of it? He does come out with Congress in the end backing him. Uh, but again, we see that um, state by state basis set up. It almost seems like that is the new normal of this law is a president can use it to declare an area a national monument, but expect that if you uh, want the state to be on board with it or not uh, drag your administration down in litigation for years and years, they're probably going to want some kind of assurances that maybe this isn't going to be the new norm. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? We've got a couple of comments. Uh, Melissa says, I don't think that Carter's actions were any different than Teddy Roosevelt's. And then Gabriel says, more questions. I'm just going to read it because it doesn't make sense to me, but I'm just going to read it verbatim. <laughs> more questions okay. for these questions in depth. And then thanks you, Josh, for your delicate presentation. <laughs> <laughs> And again, you know, what's great, well, at least for, from a president's point of view, that word antiquities, and we, if we can uh, go back up to that language. Uh, initially, when this, is, this law um, is proposed, the catalyst is the uh, theft of, of artifacts from the American Southwest. Uh, if anyone's been to Mesa Verde National Park, where I also worked as a ranger, there was the case of, of uh, archaeologist Gustav Nordenschuld, who came and just packed train car loads of artifacts, even human remains, funerary objects. Brought, uh, he was even arrested initially, but had to be released um, because there was no law in the books that said he couldn't do it. He was arrested because the argument was, People from Europe can't steal these artifacts, only Americans can steal these artifacts. But they, uh, they had to let him go, and that's kind of come full circle. A recent headline is that, I, uh, I believe, 20 human remains and 28 funerary objects, maybe those numbers are reversed, are being returned from the state of Finland to be repatriated at Mesa Verde uh, very soon. Um, uh, so kind of writing that wrong that initially uh, inspired this act, but we've had a lot of uh, tra big translation from that language, historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, but especially objects of historic or scientific interest. Um, and I think that last part, Presidents Clinton uh, and Obama and their recent designations really kind of used that, a loose interpretation of that sentence. Who's to say that a rock isn't <laughs> Uh, an object of historic interest or scientific interest thing, that whole argument. Okay, let me go back to the... There were dinosaur fossils found at Grand Circus Escalante. It was definitely... Yes, scientific. definitely okay. scientific value Josh, there. Josh, we, we, we do have a I question guess. from Ryan. Okay. And I think it's more rhetorical, but it could be one for debate for students, actually. Wouldn't any successful implementation of the Antiquities Act or any act, strengthen it as it creates and or reinforces precedent. I th that's a great it's point. It's a good one for students I mean, to debate is the way I answer those. Right, so is it, because <laughs> I, I can see both sides of it being strengthened as in this president got to use it, it got him from point A to point B, got the end result they wanted. I could also see it weakened because perhaps now there is a uh, state litmus test for every uh, invocation of this law, but it's still standing and has not been ruled unconstitutional. Uh, and it has been challenged almost endlessly since its passage uh, in 1906. So I, yeah, I can definitely see both sides of that. I think this would be an amazing debate, that last question uh, for students to have, or maybe even have an activity of what would they designate as a national monument through the Antiquities Act. Uh, and you know, what, what is the historic scientific significance? What's the smallest 
area you need to preserve this designation. That would also be really great, I believe, in the classroom. Right. Do we have any other questions, comments right now? Not at the moment. Okay, then I'll just for further inquiry, um, and this PowerPoint will, will be made available to everyone. Sessions also being recorded. Uh, some great outlets for research, particularly for more recent uh, from the uh, Congressional Research Service. I have a couple there, National Monuments and the Antiquities Act. Also the Antiquities Act, History, Current Litigation, Considerations for the 116th Congress. Uh, National Archives also has the Alaska Digitization Project, a lot of great primary uh, sources there that you can access online. National Park Service has written a lot of great history on this act and its use. Uh, Carter Library has an um, AP uh, U.S. History DBQ on the Antiquities Act, and as my uh, other colleagues are pushing, uh, the National Archives Document Analysis Worksheets are always a great accompaniment uh, doing this primary research, if anything, just to keep us from complacency. I think it's even great for us educators to use them sometimes in our research, make sure we're not getting complacent. And then I'll just leave you with that quote from Jimmy Carter, and with that, I will be handing off to Mira and the Reagan Library. Okay. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm looking for my gallery view. Um, all right, then. It's really exciting to see you here today. Can you see me? I'm here at the Reagan Library. We do see you, Mira. You look great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, I still have uh, Josh's uh, terrific, terrific deck up here on the screen. So that's what I'm looking at. Um, oh, there it goes. All right, here we are. So I'm here at the Reagan Library. It's uh, my six hour day and we're here in the Situation Room. And I'm going to be talking about that in just a little bit. But we actually were able to reinstall the Situation Room from the White House. Uh, it had been taken down, the paneling that you see around me, uh, the video cameras, the furnishings, in order to make way for a new Situation Room complex in 2006 that was going to be more technologically updated and upgraded. So what I'm in here today is a historic situation room and we've made an entire event out of that here at the Reagan Library and I'll be talking about that in just a little bit. But what we're gonna talk about today under the framework of presidential powers and precedents is are there limits to a president's power based on a president's health conditions? Um, are there limits to a president's power based on a president's health conditions? So let's go back into 1981 and let's take a look at what happened when President Reagan was shot. Um, first of all, President Reagan is shot. Oops, excuse me. President Reagan is shot. Uh, he's rushed to George Washington University Medical Hospital. Uh, it's unclear at first whether he's shot. He literally walks in to the hospital um, and he is examined, uh, put under ex anesthesia for exploratory surgery. And most people don't realize at the time what the doctors discover during this surgery, which is that uh, the bullet actually came within uh, two inches of President Reagan's heart. But the question now becomes, who is in charge? Who's in charge? The president's been shot. It's an emergency. It's an urgent situation. He's rushed over to the hospital and he's brought into surgery. Meanwhile, President, Vice President George H.W. Bush, Vice President at the time, is on the way back from Dallas. He's in Air Force Two. He sent a message by Al Haig, the Secretary of State, and he's aware that the president has been shot, but there is no clear communication that is secure with Air Force Two. 
So we have members of the president's team split into two major groups. One here, where I'm sitting right now, in the Situation Room at the White House, uh, those including Al Haig, Secretary of State, Cap Weinberger, Secretary of Defense, Richard Allen, the National Security Advisor, Fred Fielding, the White House Counselor, and others. And those led by uh, Edward Meese, Lynn Nofziger, Mike Deaver, and others at George Washington University Hospital, where a makeshift command center has been set up. So who is now president of the United States? Let's take a look at what, oh, my slide is not moving. Ah, here we go. What Al Hayek has to say uh, about that, that very same day. Let's take a look. Who is in charge right now? when President Reagan has been shot, according to Al Haig. When you know, just put the answer in the chat box. Oops, where'd he go? Sorry. Mira, Mira. Actually, we can't see your slides. Oh, you don't see my slides. Well, thank you for telling me. We see you, but we, we can't see your slides. Oh my gosh, okay, thank you for letting me know. That's very important. I think it's possible I forgot to share. <laughs> yeah. So let's take a look. Um, there we go. Now we can see him. But this is not the slideshow I wanted to share with you. So hang on just a sec. I'm sorry. Um, we got a good view of the situation room here. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, can you see him now? Yep. It says who's in charge? Who's in charge? Great. All right. Who's in charge? I thought the whole time you'd be looking at who is in charge. All right, here we go. Who's in charge? And here's Al Haig. Let's see who he thinks is in charge. Thank you for letting me know. I appreciate it. I could have just talked to these guys. Absolutely no alert measures that are necessary at this time or contemplate. Uh, now, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to take them. Crisis management is on effect. Who is making the decisions for the government right now? Who's making the decisions? Constitutionally, gentlemen, you have the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state in that order. And should the president decide he wants to tr transfer the helm, to the vice president, he, he will do so. As of now, I am in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president and in, in close touch with him. If something came up, I would check with him, of course. Okay, so who does Al Haig, the Secretary of State, say is in charge at this time? Oh, let's see. Uh, himself, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the vice president, he's, Al Haig says he's in charge reading some of these, uh, but a president is in charge even while aboard United States Air Force One. Right, so this is very confusing, isn't it? Al Haig says he's in charge. Of course, he says I'm in charge here at the White House, but we have a vice president um, and we ha who's on board an aircraft where there's no secure communication. We have a president who is either being evaluated or being uh, taken into surgery. This is a very confusing situation here. Um, and it's really unclear who is in charge of our country at this time. Um, other members of the cabinet were not in the least bit pleased that Al Haig had uh, run up to the podium and let the press know that he was in charge. They didn't know he was going to do that. Uh, they speak uh, pretty clearly about this in, in many of their memoirs, I was looking over Larry Speaks, the Deputy Press Secretary, and Edward Meese's memoir earlier today. They weren't too thrilled about this, but the real question is who actually is in charge here? So let's take a look at the Constitution. Uh, okay, here we go. So we have the 25th Amendment, um, which was set into place uh, voted into place after uh, President Kennedy died, and it was not clear 
that there was anything specific in the Constitution as to how power was to be handed over. So put into the Constitution, we have Section 1, in the case of removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. But please let me know in the chat box, does Section 1 apply here? Does Section 1 apply here? Um, Okay, so this, no, exactly, this uh, TCLA501DL, <laughs> whoever you are, thanks for your response. No, it does not apply here. The president is alive and he has not been removed from office. Uh, section two, let's take a look at that. Wherever there's a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the vice president shall nominate a vice president etc. Are we looking at section two here? Is section two relevant to our needs today? Let's see. Once again, our answer is no. Okay. So now let's take a look at section three. There are only four of these, don't worry. When the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits them to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the vice president as acting president. Uh, does section three apply here? Has President Reagan, while being rushed into surgery, transmitted uh, paperwork to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House? No, so none of this has happened. Let's take a look at section four. I came up with a graphic organizer because section four is really, really, really super long. And uh, you're more than welcome to give it to your students. Um, that would make it a little bit easier on them. Uh, by the way, this is a nice way to do a document analysis as well. Uh, this when then chart, you could provide them with section four of the 25th Amendment and ask them to fill in the when then chart, um, or you can just make it nice and easy for them. So if the vice president and majority of the cabinet think the president is unable to do their job, uh, then they provide written communication to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House. So could section four apply here? Could section four of the 25th Amendment apply to what we're looking at here? Uh, we have, I don't see a yes. Yes, thank you, Al Vasquez. <laughs> thank you, Melissa Quinn. Yes, section four could potentially apply. And what would need to happen would be the vice president, who's at the moment on an aircraft with not secure communication, and the majority of the cabinet um, could essentially enact the 25th Amendment. So, um, let's take a look at what was going on in the sit room, uh, March 30th, 1981, 70 days into President Reagan's very first administration with his new team on the job. He shot and everybody's trying to figure out who's in charge. So let's take a look. Oh, first of all, I want to ask that Al, hey, get it right. Uh, no, no, he's in it all, get it right. Um, he would have been actually fifth in line, according to uh, the Presidential Succession Act. Um, he would have been fifth in line, um, and even uh, to get to that point, all sorts of constitutionally mandated procedures would have needed to have taken place, and none of that happened. So some things that were going around in the sit room, these are actual tapes. Uh, Richard Allen, who was the National Security Advisor, literally put a tape recorder in the middle of the table to, uh, I guess, give posterity a sense of what happened that day. And we have the transcripts to those tapes, which are open and are in our collection. Uh, September 29th, the Reagan Library will be rolling out a brand new website, and you'll be able to look up all these cool things on our site, reaganlibrary.gov. Um, and you can see some of the things that they're trying to figure out uh, relating to the 25th Amendment. Um, what are we going to do? Who's in charge? How do we get done? What needs to happen tomorrow? Um, there was a dairy bill that needed to be signed by the president. And they were worried how are we going to do that. And they're going back to history when Eisenhower had a heart attack 
um, what it was done at that time. Um, and they're trying to figure out here the 25th Amendment. Is he president or is he not? Can he shift authority under the amendment, temporary basis? How does this all work? Um, and they're focused on this bill that needs to be signed. Ultimately, I'll let you know that the 25th Amendment was not enacted. President Reagan got out of surgery at 6.30. President, uh, then Vice President George H.W. Bush arrived at the White House at seven, did not enact the 25th Amendment. Some think he should have done it. Um, and President Reagan regained consciousness at 7.30 p.m. Uh, but there were about eight hours where it was super unclear who was actually in charge of the country. So we don't tell our students what happened. We give them a little bit of an opportunity to play it out. Uh, we have a role playing experience here at the Reagan Library in this space where I'm sitting now. I'm going to show you because of time, just a super quick uh, clip of what happened when Channel One came out to watch our kids in action. And I want to let you know that um, we have created virtual simulations for you to use in your classroom of this event and of uh, other events. So um, I would ask that you contact me for more information because we're starting to roll those out in classrooms right now. Let me give you just, I don't want to cut Kathleen off entirely. Let me just give you just a quick, quick show of what happened here. What this looks like during, you know, non-COVID times. Take down and kill terrorist Osama bin Laden and where White House staff met after President Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981. Some intense stuff, right? Well, some students got to experience what it's like in the Situation Room during an emergency, a simulation that's part of a program put on by the Reagan Library. And Ariel Hickson was there to see it all go down. So the really cool thing about the Situation Room experience is that there's two separate simulations going on at the same time. One outside in the press corps and one in here in the secret bunker. Yes, that would be a good choice. Here's the scenario. The president has been shot. Was he killed? Is he going to be able to survive? Who's now in charge? What would you do? Every minute counts. You had your adrenaline pumping. You wanted to solve this, solve that, figure everything out. Have you made a decision yet? There are two simulations running at the same time. The media. So who's the Secretary of Treasury? And politicians. Military response. Who make their biggest decisions here in the Situation Room. This might feel like the real thing, but don't worry. It's just a game. Or is it? When you come and participate in the Situation Room experience, I'm going to cut it off there, um, just in the interest of time. And, oh, very, very quickly, um, going back to the 25th Amendment. Yes, the Section 3 of the 25th Amendment has been enacted later on, actually, by President Reagan himself. Um, as you see here, uh, when he went in for colon cancer uh, surgery. Uh, and twice uh, by uh, George Bush. Uh, so Section 3 um, has been enacted. Section 4 has never, ever, ever, ever been enacted. Um, let's take a look. If you have any interest in getting some of our virtual simulations, uh, we're very excited because we're just starting to roll them out in this school year designed for this virtual uh, in classroom environment, go ahead and contact us at Reagan Education at nara.gov. And with that, I will pass the baton to Kathleen Pate over at the Clinton Library. All right, thank you, Mira. I appreciate that. And I'm gonna pull up my slideshow. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the War Powers Act. So a lot of what we're talking about today, um, presidential powers and precedents, we're talking about those checks and balances that are built into the Constitution. So when we look at um, presidential duties, we went over the four C's. So that second one is commander in chief. So article two names the president as commander in chief, but article one saves the power of the purse. 
and the power to declare war to Congress, to the legislature. So this doesn't become a really big deal or it's not really um, controversial or up for debate until after World War II. So, so Congress declares war um, at the president's request in World War I and World War II, but then we get into um, some military conflicts where the president is proceeding uh, without authorization from Congress. So let's go here. So we talked a little bit about that, the division of four powers. And so thinking about uh, when, this, when this controversy starts, right? So we see several administrations involved in military action or military advisors in Vietnam, right? We see um, Truman in North Korea. He sends US troops without consulting Congress, right? And Congress doesn't do anything about it, but Congress starts to get involved when um, there are troops in Vietnam. Um, by the time Nixon takes office in 1969, the tide is turning against the war and uh, Congress passes the War Powers Act. So the War Powers Act Uh, the War Powers Act, the resolution, um, it comes, it, it gathers its validity or takes its validity, validity from Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which clearly states that uh, Congress shall have the power to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution, not by its own power. But the, the War Powers Resolution calls on presidents to notify Congress of all military actions that occur outside a declaration of war within 48 hours, so within two days. And it also says any U.S. troops um, would be required to withdraw from such an action within 60 days unless Congress authorized. Congress authorizes this, this presence. And so what happens is presidents, um, at the time, President Nixon, um, is very angry about this. So we've got a great political cartoon here. Imagine Congress trying to curb my right to conduct unconstitutional wars. Why, that's unconstitutional, right? So we see a real tension here between the president as commander in chief his ability to send the military out uh, to, to intervene militarily um, and Congress's power to declare war. All right, so we see this unfold. We see challenges to this in administrations um, after the Nixon administration. Um, during the Iran hostage crisis, uh, they do, a, it's a failed mission. Um, President Carter did not notify Congress that American troops were on the ground in Iran. Um, in the Reagan administration, um, the resolution um, allowed U.S. Marines to stay in Lebanon for 18 months, but it was sidestepped um, to allow long-term long escort missions of uh, Kuwaiti oil tankers during the Iran-Iraq war. So what we see here is we see presidents basically refusing to acknowledge the War Powers Acts. And what we show in, um, in Kosovo is President Clinton, um, the UN de declines to send in peacekeeping forces so President Clinton working with NATO conducts strategic airstrikes. And this goes on for 78 days. And if you remember, the War Powers Act limits it to 60 days. And what happens is administrations since the Nixon administration have sent very carefully worded 
reports to Congress. So no president has said, I'm sending you this report in compliance with the War Powers Resolution. They use a phrase in coordination with the War Powers Resolution. And one of the things that happened um, after President, so President Clinton uh, conducted strategic airstrikes or ordered strategic airstrikes in Kosovo. Um, Slobodan Milosevic was committing genocide against the Muslim Albanian population. And those strikes continued for 78 days. So longer than the, the 60 day period and Congress had not authorized any kind of extension. But when you think about this and you think about um, the way that Congress can enforce this, right? So the way that Congress can enforce this is to withhold funding. And would you want to be the senator or representative that refused to fund troops on a mission, troops that were already deployed, right? All right. 79, I think it's actually 78, um, but the conflict does end. Milosevic backs down. And President Clinton has been sending these reports um, not in compliance with, but in conjunction with. And what happens is a member of Congress attempts to sue President Clinton for violating the War Powers Act. And what happens is the courts say that he has no standing to bring a suit against the president. So it is a source of ongoing debate. Um, and so I wanna open the floor to questions. I know that we have covered a lot of information, but I'm also seeing, I know I ran through my slides pretty quickly. Um, I'm also seeing that it is 428. And I believe we said this going to last 90 minutes. So I wanna open the floor to questions and those can be questions for any of the panelists, although uh, Mira has stepped away. Um, Josh is here, Elizabeth is here, Angela is here. So questions about um, presidential powers and these tests that we see, this tension that we see between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and then the judicial branch kind of interpreting the Constitution. No questions. All right, well, we're getting a great shout out. Whole presentation, quite informative, good bit of US history, of which I was unaware. Right, so Congress has the power to pass laws and the president enforces the laws. Um, why did the Supreme Court say that Campbell um, did not have, let me go to my notes on this because I want to get it right. And that was Tom Campbell of, so 31 members of Congress led by Tom Campbell of California filed suit. And let's see what happened. Um, it was heard by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, members who brought suit argued that Clinton had exceeded the limits. The Clinton administration argued that Congress had offered its implicit authorization for continued operations through its vote to fund the operation and lack of a vote requiring the U.S. to disengage. Ultimately, uh, the court ruled on the side of the president declaring that the congressman may not challenge the president's war making powers in federal court, but must rely, must, must instead rely on their quote, ample legislative power to stop the prosecution of the war. So the court said, you're the legislative body, you can pass laws, you can do what you need to to stop the president. Um, and they said, you, 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 can't, you can't sue him over this. So it's interesting to think about 
how do you, how does Congress enforce laws when it is the executive branch job to enforce laws, right? So how do they hold the president accountable? And it really is tied into that funding. And by continuing to fund this military intervention in Kosovo, the Clinton administration was basically su successful in arguing that they had given their authorization because they were paying for it. All right, it's really one of those, it's kind of like the questions that Josh asked. Um, the War Powers Resolution um, does not have an easy answer. Okay, Ryan, that's a really, yes. Um, so doesn't it immediately take the teeth out of any congressional act that the president may not agree with? Um, I was part of some really great um, civics classes at Little Rock Central High last year, and they um, were arguing about who, what branch of government, which branch of government is most powerful. And yes, outside of impeachment, you know, uh, the president can, he can use the Antiquities Act, he can pass an executive order, he can send troops. All right, Teresa's calling for other questions. And then we will be sharing these presentations. We'll actually share them with um, Teresa so she can get them out to all of our participants. We are a little bit over time, so if there are no pressing questions. Um, Josh, I did want to point out um, behind me, this is the Clinton Oval Office replica, mm -hmm. and there is no wallpaper. And this is the view that you would see you're sitting behind the Resolute desk. And then this is the view you would see looking toward the desk. Okay, escalation, I've already deployed, might lead or not lead, funding, layers. Can we say that the judicial branch has the ultimate say? Why don't we say that? <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's an ongoing, um, you know, you've seen five examples of um, presidential power expanding and sometimes the courts you know check that balance that um, and and sometimes they don't and sometimes it doesn't get to court uh, I think someone mentioned Eisenhower sending in troops uh, for the central high crisis based on my reading of the Constitution that was probably illegal whether or not it was the right thing to do, it was probably unconstitutional. Okay. If there are no other questions, Angela, Josh, Elizabeth, do you have any parting thoughts, comments? Um. Just message me, email me if you have any questions. And if you didn't get that folder for some reason, uh, let me or Teresa know. And We'll make sure you get that link. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for um, uh, getting all of the uh, Wheel of Fortune questions. You were, you were on point with those. <laughs> thank you for joining us. All right. All right. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you for your time. And uh, like Elizabeth said, if you need the PowerPoints um, or you need me to send you our YouTube channel to access the recording, please feel free to email me. Uh, T. Perlowski at internet2.edu. All right. right. You've got all kinds of things to share. I'm going to send some links to you, Therese, to our digital library and our YouTube channel as well. Perfect. All right. Everybody have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.